Well, ARK Invest is at it again, predicting what at first glance seems like insane numbers for humanoid robots and the economic potential. But on a closer look, I think they're right on the money. So let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I want to talk to you today about this ARK Invest white paper that they produced on September 10th, which is yesterday as I record this. I will of course leave a link in the description so you can read it at your own leisure, but I'm gonna go over the main points that I think are important and explain not only what Sam Chorus and ARK are thinking, but also why I think they are correct. So starting with the title, How ARK is Thinking About Humanoid Robotics. So Sam starts by quoting Elon Musk, who is another, you know, obvious forward thinker here. As Elon Musk said during Tesla's first quarter earnings call, if you've got a sentient humanoid robot that is able to navigate reality and do tasks at request, there is no meaningful limit to the size of the economy. Musk was sharing a vision that we believe is turbocharging the robotics industry, creating new robotics companies and increasing venture investments focused on its promise. While Musk is envisioning humanoid robots that exceed human capability, even before that moment in time, if humanoid robots are able to operate at scale, they could generate about $24 trillion in revenues, split roughly equally between household and manufacturing robotics, according to ARC's research as shown below. And then Sam shows us a graphic that we have actually seen before. I've actually looked at this and done a video about this earlier. So I'm going to go over this relatively quickly. But over on the left, you can see that the household opportunity for, you know, household robotics, in other words, ones that would be in your home, doing your laundry, mowing the lawn, whatever, is about a 12 and a half trillion dollar opportunity, while manufacturing robots are approximately the equal size, about 12 trillion dollar opportunity. And the green cells here are how they figure this out. They basically take the average of these numbers, these are in trillions of dollars, of course, and that averages out to about $12 trillion, which is what they say is their expected value for manufacturing robots. And notice here, we're looking at 2030 as the date. So we're not talking about that far away. So ARC is being very aggressive in their predictions here, but I think that they're pretty much spot on because I think that humanoid robots, once people have come up with an efficient way to manufacture them, will be manufactured in very, very large numbers because the economic opportunity is just so large. And before we leave this graphic, really quickly, this productivity uplift is relative to a human worker. As far as I understand it, we're going to look at this later on in the article. So it's important that we understand this. Basically, you're saying if the robot is 110% as useful as a human, in other words, is as useful as a human plus 10%, then we get these numbers. If it's 50% more useful than a human being, which it could be even if it works at the speed of a human being, but is able to work double the hours, then you could see it being worth 50 or 100% of a human human worker because it can work longer hours. And then of course the take rate is just how many of them they're selling basically. Moving on, in this article we focus on the robotics opportunity in US manufacturing. According to our research, the US manufacturing sector employs nearly 12 million people for approximately $785 billion in pay to produce output worth $2.4 trillion, as shown below. In the unlikely event that it were to substitute robots for all human workers and put them to work for 16 hours a day, not going to happen anytime soon. The manufacturing sector would need only 5.9 million robots, half the number of human workers employed today, to deliver the same level of manufacturing output as shown below. So first of all, we're taking away the household use right here. We're getting rid of household robotics, only talking about manufacturing robotics and only in the United States. But even there, you can see if we had a one-to-one -one replacement of robots with human beings and they were able to work twice as many hours as humans, you could approximately half the amount of pay that these companies would have to put out versus humans to get the same amount of productivity. That is a gigantic gain in net productivity. Then of course, Sam turns to a more likely scenario where humanoid robots will debut at higher price points and be much less capable than their human counterparts, that will definitely be true at the beginning. According to our research, humanoid robots will become more economically viable than human employees at tipping points in their net present value that balance the cost of a humanoid robot against the productivity gains they will enable, as shown in the table below. At a cost of $16,000, for example, a humanoid robot will have to deliver little more than 5% gain in productivity relative to its human counterpart to become economically viable. For context, Musk has suggested that complexity per unit mass is much higher with humanoid robots, but still I think it ends up costing less than half of that of a car. So if your average car sells for around $40,000, then $16,000 would be about half. So you can see at $16,000 for the robot, and I assume that's the purchase price plus maintenance and things like that, if you get a 10% uplift, in other words, if the robot 
working however it does, twice as many hours, but only about 60% as efficiently as a human, whatever that metric is, if it can give you a 10% productivity uplift, so it's basically 110% of one human being, that's all you need for it to be a net positive for a company. And that makes it a really easy decision for companies to be able to turn to that. Of course, as the price goes up, if you get to $230,000 for one of these robots, you need it to be about 75% more efficient than a human being. That's not going to happen at the beginning. We're probably going to be looking at $100,000 per robot at the beginning, you know, somewhere in that realm. And it's unlikely that their productivity uplift will be 50% at that point. So they will probably in the early days be a net loss for companies, which is why companies like Tesla and so forth will likely use these robots internally while they're developing them until they can bring the cost down. And then, of course, as the cost goes from $100,000 to $60,000 to 40, then to 20 or 16 or something, then it becomes much easier for companies companies outside the company manufacturing the robots to make the obvious decision to bring in robots into those companies. And then of course you get a virtuous cycle because you sell more robots. By rights law, the prices come down on these robots. That makes it easier for companies to purchase them. They purchase more, you produce more robots, et cetera, et cetera. Then we get to some interesting insights I really hadn't thought much about before, but it's really, really cool to think about. As we put the tipping point model into real world context, two variables in manufacturing are important to consider, company size and labor share, the share of revenue going to compensate labor. In other words, if your company is very, very employee salary heavy, then that means that most of the profit of the company gets pushed back into paying your employees off. And that means that you have a relatively thin margin in terms of actual profits after paying your employees. Employees. Whereas if you pay your employees relatively small amounts relative to your revenue, then you have a different situation entirely. So this is where we get into the weeds of small companies versus large companies, and this becomes really interesting. As Sam says, unlike in small firms where employees are likely to wear more than one hat, yeah, I know that feeling, <laughs> large manufacturing firms are organized by specialized and automated tasks. As a result, over time, their productivity has been more than twice as high as the smallest firms. Specialization and automation gives large firms the wherewithal to scale significantly and in turn lower labor costs as a share of revenue. Consequently, and somewhat counter intuitively, large companies typically pay higher wages than small firms because automating specific tasks typically boosts the productivity in large firms more than in small firms, as illustrated in the two charts below. And so in this example, you can see in a small company that 40% of the revenue of the company goes to labor, to humans that are employed, and they pay the humans a little bit less than they do in large companies. Here in a larger company, only 20% of the labor share goes to employees, but they pay the individual employees more. But what's really interesting here is in these small companies where employees wear more than one hat. In order for automation in the form of robots to take the place of these people, they need to be generalized solutions. They can't be single purpose robots. Whereas in large companies like a, you know, like a large auto manufacturer or something, you can replace an individual with a very specialized robot, just like an arm that just moves something from place to place. And that's all it does. It can cost $100,000, $200,000 to install that. But of course, over time, by getting rid of employees that have to do that same job, you end up saving money. And so the more specialized, the larger the company, the more specialized the manufacturing and the types of roles that humans do, the easier it is to replace a human with a special purpose robot. But for smaller companies where humans have to do more than one task, often many, many tasks, that's where you want a generalized humanoid solution. And on that note, as Sam says, because generalized automation solutions, those for multiple tasks, have not evolved as quickly as automation solutions for specific tasks, in other words, an arm that just moves something back and forth, small firms typically have a disproportionate number of automatable but not yet automated tasks that would benefit from generalizable solutions like humanoid robots. In other words, as Scott Walter says, that would be low-hanging fruit. This is the perfect place to deploy humanoid robots into the smaller companies companies that manufacture things, but where people have to do multiple jobs and not just a single job. I'll skip over this really interesting graph. You should definitely look at it on your own time about labor share and everything. But moving down to the next paragraph, thanks to their more specialized employment positions, large manufacturers typically benefit more than small companies from single task automation solutions and enjoy lower labor costs relative to revenues as shown below. With less job specialization, small manufacturers are burdened with higher labor costs and therefore are 
are likely to benefit disproportionately from more generalizable humanoid robotic solutions. So you can see here that about a third of the revenue for small companies goes directly back to paying for employees. While that percentage goes down to around 18% for a large company, I think that's 20,000 employees or more. So it's a really big deal for these small companies because labor is expensive relative to revenues. And then you can see from this graph that really in the United States, at least, most people who work in these industries actually work for small companies, not for large companies. And in conclusion, Sam says, in the aftermath of COVID-related supply chain shocks, onshoring and labor shortages could provide meaningful tailwinds for humanoid robots, lowering management's sensitivity to their price and thereby accelerating the transformation of manufacturing. As a result, our research suggests that the market value of generalizable robots, in other words, humanoid form factor robots, could scale into the tens of trillions of dollars. And of course, the multi-billion dollar question is what he ends with. The biggest question now is, how quickly will AI software enable human-like performance across the subsectors of manufacturing and beyond? So in terms of manufacturing, what Sam Corus and ARK Invest are saying is that companies that are looking to deploy in large factories, for example, figure working with BMW, is actually probably a mistake. The lowest hanging fruit, the best place for them to initially deploy these robots, where they will make the most economic sense, is actually in small companies, where specialized robots are just too expensive, and yet labor costs are very, very high. This is the perfect place for a humanoid robot to be able to replace a human being. Now, in large manufacturing companies like auto manufacturing plants, are there still jobs that can be done by a generalizable humanoid form factor robot that can't economically be done by a single purpose robot? Absolutely. And so if you're a company like Tesla, you can easily put Optimus into your factories. You can, you know, quote unquote, eat your own dog food. In other words, use the robots in your own environments train them up, make enough of them that rights law kicks in and the robots become cheaper and cheaper. You can then afford to either lease or sell them to other manufacturing companies. And that starts the flywheel of making these robots become ubiquitous across the manufacturing industry. But the really interesting thing that ARC is saying here is that the next place that Tesla and other companies should focus after getting the initial robots going and figuring out how to scale production is actually small businesses to medium-sized businesses not large businesses. So that's a really intriguing insight by ARC. What do you think about that? I think they're probably onto something. And honestly, I still think that household robots have a real place. And I think that 1X and other companies that are looking to put robots into the house as opposed to into industry are actually taking a viable angle. I love that we're getting a multitude of different angles on how to insert these humanoid robots into our society, both at home, small manufacturing, large manufacturing, and of course, other places that we probably haven't even thought of yet. Again, remember what, you know, when we had cell phones that didn't have screens on them, they weren't smartphones. There was only so much imagination we had about what they would be able to do. And yet in 2024, smartphones have taken over the world, basically. They're in everybody's pockets. They're being used for all kinds of things that people who would have had cell phones back in the 90s and early 2000s couldn't even imagine. So there's something that humanoid robots will be used for in the future that we can't even imagine yet. But in the meantime, as they're rolling out, ARC says that they should go into small companies first, small manufacturing companies. And I think that's a bold prediction and I actually agree with them. So those are ARC's thoughts and my thoughts. Let me know in the comments what you think about all of that. And while you're down there, if you don't mind liking and subscribing, it super helps out the channel. I'd love to get to 100,000 subscribers one day soon. So help me out and thank you so much. And I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye. Thank you.